thank you all for coming. Um, we're um, very fortunate. This is a um, you know, part of African American History Month program, and uh, every year we try to bring a speaker. We have a number of people. Some of you may have been to the hip hop festival, and we have march around the campus and a few other things. But we try to bring a, uh, a speaker, a scholar, someone who has written and just talked about issues related to African American history. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Corey Walker, who is the chair of the Department of Africana Studies at Brown University. Um, Dr. Walker actually was here two years ago. He was very well received, and we were very lucky to get him back again. Um, he, uh, just to give you very slight, he's, a, as I said, he's the chair of the department at Brown. Um, people can major in Africana studies, and he may be, he mentioned that, and he may be interested. He has our, some of our students transfer to Brown. Uh, but um, he's the author of a number of books and articles uh, in uh, African American history. He um, has taught at Brown, I think he's been there five or six years now. You know, earlier he taught at the University of Virginia, also taught at the University of Jena at, in uh, Germany. He uh, speaks all around the country, just mentioned that he's given about five of these talks around the country. So um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Walker here to talk about a uh, new birth to freedom. This is the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. This is also the 50th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington, where uh, Dr. King gave his famous speech. Uh, it's been 50 years now. Where are we? What progress we made? Dr. Walker will discuss all of that. Dr. Walker. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be back here at Bristol Community College. Uh, I really enjoy uh, coming here, and whenever Ron asks, uh, it's always an easy answer, uh, yes. Uh, one word, uh, always in the affirmative. Um, he meant, uh, Ron mentioned that uh, I'm the chair of the Department of Africana Studies at Brown, and uh, we not only uh, have a major uh, concentration in Africana Studies, we are one of 12 departments across the nation uh, that offer a PhD in Africana Studies. So we're now uh, training uh, the next generation. We're one of four uh, universities in the Ivy League that offer a PhD. It's now uh, Harvard, Yale, Brown, and the University of Pennsylvania. And eventually, uh, Cornell University will offer one, and uh, Columbia University. Cornell uh, currently, uh, Columbia offers an MA program and Princeton, uh, where my good friend Eddie Glaude is chair of the uh, Center for African American Studies, offers a graduate certificate, and I'm sure uh, Princeton will soon offer a PhD. So we're always looking for students, uh, always looking for good students to come to Brown and good students to come into Africana Studies. So uh, make sure you uh, contact me if you're interested about that, if you're interested in Africana Studies, and I love recruiting. So uh, every opportunity to speak at another university, uh, where I see engaging young bright minds is another opportunity where we at Brown can welcome uh, the next generation of scholars uh, in the discipline of Africana Studies. Um, Ron also mentioned uh, yeah, this year marks the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, and the 50th anniversary of King's, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. It also marks the 50th anniversary of the publication uh, of a wonderful text by uh, that protein thinker James Baldwin, A Fire Next Time. It also marks uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, King's eulogy for the martyred children. Uh, the bombing uh, of 16th Street Baptist Church in, in, in Birmingham or Birmingham, uh, Alabama. So we're in one of these moments where we're all reflecting on where we've been and where we're going. And in many ways, I want to use this opportunity for us to think around uh, these two uh, texts, but uh, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, as well as uh, King's I Have a Dream speech. But in thinking about them, I don't want to memorialize them as uh, the finished product of what we think about as the American journey around democracy and freedom, but rather I want us to look at them as an opportunity uh, to begin to think about uh, a new experience of freedom and what freedom will look like not only today, 
uh, but more importantly, what it will look like in the future. Because I do believe that we have an opportunity to begin uh, to delineate how we think about freedom and community in our moment. And while these documents provide us with an instance uh, to look back, reflect, and remember, they also uh, serve as an impetus for us to begin to think again about freedom in our own moment. Um, we can go around and give a wonderful history uh, of the Emancipation Proclamation, its first issuance in September of 1862, and of course, uh, the final proclamation that's issued on January 1st, 1863, uh, when Lincoln uh, has to uh, first not sign the initial uh, Emancipation Proclamation, and uh, early that morning in January, uh, had to stall it, uh, stall his signature, because part of uh, the, uh, part of the uh, text of the Emancipation had to be revised. And of course, we all know that uh, most individuals, particularly African Americans, uh, saw the emancipation both a, as, a, as a wonderful opportunity, but also as a promise unfulfilled. Uh, because the requisite, prerequisites for freedom were not uh, delineated or given within that document. Uh, Lincoln recognized that this was uh, a military moment, and he used his, as, he used his powers as commander-in-chief to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. In order for uh, slavery to be fully abolished, uh, we had to uh, pass the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery uh, in order for uh, freedom for enslaved Africans uh, to take place in a civil manner. Fifty years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, uh, there was enormous celebrations uh, in the U.S. I mean, James, uh, James Weldon Johnson wrote a wonderful poem uh, that was published on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, the great W.E.B. Du Bois uh, had a wonderful pageant, a, a Negro history pageant that he that drew over 3,000 people each night. A um, hundred years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, uh, there was more reserved uh, uh, commentary. And of course, we're going to use uh, two texts from that moment, uh, both Baldwin's uh, Fire Next Time, as well as King's I Have a Dream, to look at the false promises or the failure of American democracy. And of course, now 150 years later, uh, we're going to open up a line of thinking about the meaning of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, as in light of uh, King and Baldwin's word and thinking. So I don't want this to be uh, a history speech delineated with just dates, names, times, and places. Those can be readily found uh, within a number of books uh, and within a number of histor you know, uh, our historians. Uh, instead, I want us to begin to think through what this means for us in our contemporary moment. Why should I care? Or in other words, what is the price of freedom in our particular moment? And let's open up more formally with uh, three quotes. Uh, one from James Baldwin, uh, from his letter, um, uh, letter to his uh, nephew, uh, uh, James, that's included in the fire next time, but it was a letter that was actually published in the Progressive in 1961. Uh, the title of the letter, the letter was, My Dungeon Shook. And in that uh, searing letter that's included uh, in that uh, Fire Next Time volume that was published in April of 1963, uh, Baldwin writes these lines. You know and I know that this country is celebrating 100 years of freedom, 100 years too early. You know and I know the, this, that the country is celebrating 100 years of freedom, 100 years too early. And of course now the second quote that opened that for our thinking is offered by Martin Luther King Jr. who on the centennial of the initial in issuance of the uh, Emancipation Proclamation uh, on September 22nd, uh, 1962 uh, and commemorating the Emancipation Proclamation, the first one that was issued, uh, King in, in New York wrote these words. We have spelled out a balance sheet of the Emancipation Proclamation its contributions and its deficiencies, which our lack of zeal permitted to find expression. There is but one way to commemorate the Emancipation Proclamation. That is to make its declaration of freedom real, to reach back to the origins of our nation, 
when our message of equality electrified an unfree world and reaffirmed democracy by deeds as bold and daring as the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. And finally, the last quote for our thought is offered by the, inevitable, the, uh, the incomparable historian of religions, Charles H. Long, who in battling uh, at the University of Chicago uh, penned these words, commenting on the visibility of African Americans uh, during the modern black freedom struggle. The visibility of the black community in America is our challenge and opportunity to develop a theology of freedom, a freedom for humanity, a new humanity. What these three quotes remind us and what they announce is that we can profitably use the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation and the 50th anniversary of King's uh, I Have a Dream speech as an invitation to undertake an inquiry into the very conditions of freedom in our contemporary moment. Instead of positing some linear chronology that moves us from slavery to freedom, as announced by these, these moments of anniversary, we have the opportunity to question our thinking about freedom and how these texts afford us a new opportunity to commit ourselves to developing new practices of freedom in our world today. As a scholar working in the discipline of Africana studies, I'm constantly intrigued by questions that hint that work that, uh, that, that should be broached within the realm of history as well as within the realm of social and political thought. With regard to the question of freedom, we are necessarily confronted with a number of issues that hit not only on history, but also in our social and political imaginaries. If we fail to highlight these, the, the contingencies of history, as well as how we think about these ideas and how they support our political, social, and cultural practices, we may enter a moment whereby one thing seems to go imperial and rule, all, rule out all others. More importantly, we evade a nuanced and more critical understanding about our conversation on American democracy, and more importantly, how we value the worth, dignity, and, uh, and uh, res respect the personality of all people. By opening up a line of thinking into the coordinates of freedom, I want us to grapple with the fundamental character of the political and intellectual shift in our moment and how we together can begin to think about freedom much more broadly, much more expansively, and much more radically. Instead of thinking along a, a linear line, perhaps we may begin to rehearse what the Emancipation Proclamation means, as well as what King's I Have a Dream offers us in opening up what, the, what Wilson Harris, the Guyanese philosophical novelist, calls a new corpus of sensibility. And what is that new corpus of sensibility? How do we begin to develop a line of thinking into that? This morning, I'd like us to begin by looking, looking at a, a text from King and how King reassesses the Emancipation Proclamation and its unfulfilled promises of freedom. And in so doing, he opens up a way of thinking, a style of thinking, a protein way of thinking into the new possibilities of freedom in our moment. <laughs> Reflecting on the pivotal uh, post-emancipation period King writes, with all the beautiful promise that Frederick Douglass saw in the Emancipation Proclamation, he soon found it left the Negro with only abstract freedom. Four million newly liberated slaves found themselves with no bread to eat, no land to cultivate, no shelter to cover their heads. It was like freeing a man 
who had been unjustly imprisoned for years, and on discovering his innocence, sending him out with no bus fare to get home, no suit to cover his body, no financial compensation to atone for his long years of incarceration, and to help him get around, get a sound footing in society. Sending him out with only the assertion, now you are free. What greater injustice could society perpetuate? All the moral voices, voices of the universe, all the codes of sound jurisprudence would rise up with condemnation at such an act. Yet this is exactly what America did to the Negro. In 1863, the Negro was given abstract freedom expressed in luminous rhetoric. But in an agrarian economy, he was given no land to make liberation concrete. After the war, the government granted white settlers, without cost, millions of acres in the West, thus providing America's new white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But at the same time, its oldest peasantry, the Negro, was denied everything but a legal status he could not use, could not consolidate, could not even defend. As Frederick Douglass came to say, emancipation granted the Negro freedom to hunger, freedom to winter amid the rains of heaven. Emancipation was freedom and famine at the same time. Now King offers these words on, on the Emancipation Proclamation in, lang in a language where we may not be that we may not be familiar with. In many ways, his words are a challenge for us to grapple with a much more capacious and robust vision of freedom. Indeed, his language eludes the parameters of the political of the proper frames of political discourse. Indeed, King's vision of freedom is one that goes to the very depth and complexity of American democracy. His vision of human being and belonging is one that we must attend to in how we begin to think principally about freedom in our, in our given moment. And with King, we have to think with a poetic form of thinking about our political life. For King brings a vision of freedom together with a more robust vision of how we can be human in the world. To think of King through this register is not to frame him by the dictates that seek to suture him in that moment of transcendence on that Washington afternoon on August 27th, 1963. Instead, it is to wrestle with a king that finds, it, that finds himself grappling with the depths of our humanity, grappling with the depths of human possibility, all in the image, all in the desire to open us up to a new experience of freedom. King who reminds us, not in the I Have a Dream speech, but in his eulogy for the martyred children of 1963, that we have to grapple with the horror and the hope of this experiment with American democracy. Even when realizing that death is not the limit experience for all of us, King recognizes that we have to, faith, we have to face the death of our democracy in order to have a new experience of the birth of freedom. Indeed, King reminds us that what we have to do is to begin to hope against hope itself, to think, against, to think about freedom against the freedom to which we think of in our everyday. And it is this, this complicated and complex king that wrestles intimately with the memory of Lincoln and the memory of the emancipation that challenges us to push forward in a new way of considering our democracy and on our society. In the introduction to his meditations on Martin Luther King Jr., noted historian Vincent Harding writes, 
My hope is that we might fight, we might press ourselves beyond amnesia and engage the tougher, more difficult king. Harding cautions us to stave off the pressing tendency to memorialize King in the all too familiar and heroic fashion. That is, the King that stood, that lives forever in the unbroken sunlight of that historic August day on the Mall in Washington when hundreds and thousands of us stood in that place and millions more gathered in front of their set, television sets across the nation to affirm our solidarity with his vision of racial harmony and triumphant freedom. Harding instead wants us to wrestle with that inconvenient hero who challenges us with his insistence to speak truth to power and his calling to take great risks on behalf of hope, all in service and solidarity to the least among us. To confront this king, to think about this freedom in our particular moment, is to expose and inhabit the normative gap between the real and the ideal. It is to challenge and confront the smooth languages and discourses of politics with the very disruptive articulation that we want freedom now. Such a politics is irreducible to policy and irreducible to the thinking of politicians. Indeed, in 1961, King wrote in his essay, The Time for Freedom Has Come, stated, behind this spiritual explosion is the shattering of a material atom. What he meant by this is that the idea of freedom is not only in our imaginary, Instead, it must be manifested in our everyday life. And for King, such a freedom was not reform. It was not a freedom that can be amended to, with the, amended to the United States Constitution. Indeed, it was a new vision of freedom that was best captured in the Negro spiritual, O Freedom. When the spiritual reads, O Freedom, O oh freedom, how freedom, how I love thee. And before I will be a slave, I will be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. It is also a freedom best captured in the words of a postcard left by one of King's students. When the student wrote, I sought my soul, but my soul I could not see. I sought my God, but he eluded me. I sought my brother, and I found all three. From such a perspective, and through such an understanding of freedom, we come to understand the radical implications of taking up a new thinking for a new experience of freedom in our moment. And indeed, when we do this, we are reminded that the whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. It is not an easy task to talk about freedom in our particular moment. Indeed, what we may think of will not be easily, easy to speak. In many ways, the way in which we're talking about freedom, the way in which we're thinking about it, will be an absurd word in a moment of confusing and contradictory rhetoric. Indeed, a rhetoric that tells us about globalization, rogue states, wars on terror, and elections without choice. But it is this absurdity that you and I must face and must speak if we are to conjure a vocabulary and fashion a language to speak on a subject and make it real in our lives. And all I hope that we will accept a challenge that was set out by the great cultural studies theorist Stuart Hall to develop a strategy of contestation around the very term. And in so doing, we will attempt to speak the word, not to follow the prescriptions of the powerful who command and exploit, 
but to speak the word in making and remaking history. And in closing, we end with James Baldwin's letter to his nephew. And that letter where Baldwin sets out these words. And if the word integration means anything, this is what it means. That we, with love, shall force our brothers to see themselves as they are, to cease fleeing from reality and begin to change it. Indeed, a new experience of freedom forces us, challenges us, indeed commits us to working toward that new experience of freedom now and into the long future. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments? Um, don't be afraid for how to formulate them, uh, formulate your questions. Uh, we're all friends and all freedom fighters uh, in our own right, so. Go ahead. How did the building blocks of equality start? How did the building blocks of equality start? Yeah. They started they, as they always start, with everyday folks saying, I want to be free. And when we think of the experience uh, here in the United States, it finds its expression uh, in the ways in which individuals not only express their freedom in our revered political documents of an age, but more importantly, with the ways in which everyday folks said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And enslaved Africans walked off plantations, created maroon communities. Our women began a freedom struggle uh, in the 19th century. And of course, the, those explosions of freedom continue today when individuals say our, our economic system is too rife with, is too, um, uh, too much characterized by inequality, that we must stop wars on terror, that we must stop war, period. So there's all, the beginning is always with us and always with humanity, and it continues even today, now and into the long future. Uh, just a comment, the president yesterday dedicated a statue to a woman who had a lot to do with that stop. Mm -hmm. President dedicated a statue to Rosa Parks yesterday and the Supreme Court heard a challenge uh, relative to uh, the efficacy of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And this week was momentous because not just uh, for the memorialization of Rosa Parks, and remember it's all, always easy to memorialize people after they're dead. Uh, 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 Carl Wendell wrote a wonderful uh, poem about how we memorialize King after he was assassinated at the age of 39 in 1968. And of course, when he's assassinated, no one is around him. I mean, he's fighting for uh, garbage workers uh, in Memphis, Tennessee working with them, walking with them in their strike. And of course, that memory is gone. And it's easy for us to memorialize it, but when we think of also what happened yesterday, the oral arguments uh, around the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and of course the comments by uh, our conservative jurist, uh, uh, Antonin Scalia, who said, isn't the Voting Rights Act just another racial entitlement? We realize that uh, n there are no, there are no num there's not a number of statues, no amount of statues can actually uh, give us the new experience of freedom. Instead, it's gonna take you and I working long and hard, day in and day out, to make freedom real. Statues are nice, but freedom is a long struggle. And that's what we have to commit ourselves to. And I'm also reminded that this week also uh, we, we're, we find ourselves reading uh, a statement issued by Supreme Court Justice uh, Sotomayor who rebuked the uh, Justice Department because we have a prosecutor in the Justice Department who made a statement. And that statement uh, drew on the deep veins of racism in America. And the State Department uh, prosecutor stated, you have 
uh, you have African Americans, you have Latinos, and you have a bag full of money. Now doesn't a light bulb go off in your head that this is a drug deal? So at the same time I recognize that there's a moment of uh, uh, celebration and memorialization by the unveiling of a statue, I realize that there's much, much more to be, uh, to be fought for. Let me go here, hold on. And what could you say, I am so concerned about, of course, in the United States, mm -hmm. freedom and the amount of illiteracy that is going down in the country. Well, there's, uh, that, that is a deep question about how we understand uh, the nature of education. Um, all too often when, I'm, uh, when I go around and speak at universities, um, I treat my students, I treat students at any university as if I treat students in my classroom. I want to challenge them with, th with critical thinking uh, and not just with the regurgitation of facts or regurgitation of, uh, of, of quote unquote important figures. Because if you don't know how these people come onto the scene and why they matter, and then how to begin to think about what it means in our particular moment, then education becomes rote. Uh, education becomes uh, not, something, uh, not something related to how we live our lives, but becomes another uh, uh, paper that we collect in order for us to take our place within society. In many ways, education should be the most disruptive force in our society. Our institutions, should, our institutions of higher education should be our most, uh, uh, our hotbed of new ferment for new expressions of freedom. Our students are our future. Every student that I see, I look at them and I see in their eyes, the eyes of my two daughters. I have a two-year-old and a nine-year-old. And everything that I do, everything that I say is in light of how I look into their eyes. When I see that they have to face a world that I cannot imagine at this moment, that then makes me uh, take this task of education quite seriously. And, and so in taking it seriously, it means uh, that I must issue fundamental challenges to my students and to all who I speak to uh, around what these important texts or what these ideas mean in our particular moment. Not the ways in which the powerful would like us to understand them. Not within the dominant narrative that reaffirms the status quo, but within the ways in which these texts uh, work against the very power regimes that marginalize the lives and life chances of so many individuals throughout uh, our nation and throughout the world. In many ways, the challenge is for you to take up your pen, your books, your paper, and me as a teacher, to begin to challenge you to have us experience new ways of thinking about the world and then acting on them. That's the only way we can get uh, 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 individuals like King, individuals like Ella Baker, and even the ways in which we get an audacious statement that's full of compromise and full of, uh, full of compromise and also of promise, how we get a document like the Emancipation Proclamation. So, yeah. Do you see today's um, discussions about immigration the same thing as the civil rights of the 60s? Mm -hmm. About getting um, Spanish speaking people from Central and South America the same rights and privileges? Of course. Uh, King was a deep follower of uh, Cesar Chavez. And the immigrant movement and, and immigrant and uh, migrant worker movement in the 1960s was also a movement that was connected with the black freedom struggle. And remember, this was a global, uh, and, uh, this was a global movement. So as early as 1957, King would say uh, about the Montgomery bus boycott. Now, actually, this is 1956. Uh, King would say that the Montgomery bus boycott is part, of, we're part of 800 million people across the world fighting for freedom. So there was nothing, in a sense, uh, what our, what our uh, universities do is begin to reinforce uh, the disaggregation uh, of these movements and not thinking through the protein ways in which individuals are moving across lines of difference, across lines uh, of race and ethnicity, and coming together to develop that new experience of freedom, not only within the U.S., but globally. How else do we understand that this Baptist minister 
from, uh, from, jo from uh, Atlanta, Georgia in 1957 was in Ghana at the moment of Ghana's independence from Great Britain. If this were just a movement that was localized around uh, bus, the Montgomery bus boycott or if it was localized around the U.S., there would be no need for King to actually go uh, to Ghana. But this was part of a worldwide movement of, of black and brown individuals across the world. And of course, this comes out of the deep connections uh, from the 1955 uh, Asian-African summit uh, in Bangdong. So what we see in the modern moment is but the long fruition of a truly a global movement for freedom. And when we think of what's going on now in the world, there's still those global echoes and those global resonances when we see our colleagues and comrades rising up in Ecuador, rising up on the continent uh, of Africa, rising up throughout Europe. So this is a continuation of what Octavio uh, Paz said, a beautiful explosion uh, where the oppressed people were uh, in the 20th century exploded with all vibrancy and all newness and that explosion continues today. So yes, this is a continuation of that. In many ways, um, when we begin to think about these moments, we have to think about them within that register so that we don't see it as, oh, this is something over there, or this is something over there. No, this is about us and about freedom. Go ahead. This is just a comment. Um, about 44 years ago, there was a dozen African-American students who wanted to have this one this flag uh, to be in memory of Dr. King and Malcolm X. Uh, they were threatened with jail. Uh, 21 years ago, I inherited this struggle. After a lot of research, uh, a lot of homework, a lot of research, legwork, uh, also confrontation with the power structure, uh, the mayor's office, city council, you name it, uh, even the police. I had to take them to court with the help of the, Amy Ch the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And after years of struggle, uh, unfortunately it cost me. Uh, for a time, I was a homeless vet for, about six, for almost six months, living on the streets. Uh, after so many, finally, just last year, the mayor had agreed to the terms, and this flag will fly with the other nations in the world. As Dr. Walker alluded to, this is not an isolated uh, incident, it's just a part of the struggle. And this flag here represents 97 countries for people of African descent. And I'm proud to say, well, humbly, and <coughs> proudly, I'm proud to play that movement for the over 20 years. Well, thank you for that comment, and thank you for your dedication. <laughs> but. What year was Martin Luther King Jr. born? Uh, 1929. Cut, Ron. Somebody else. Oh, okay. Um, when we look at our American culture now, um, some might say we've headed so far into consumerism, into um, sort of letting things wash over us. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned education mm -hmm. as a huge force, which of course I agree. Um, how do you see?
is hopeful for our culture to be able to enact and never forget and always continue to move forward. Well, um, the one thing that we can begin to do is, uh, the one thing that we strive against is, uh, well, I strive against is the idea that, um, that complexity, that our complex society can be whittled down into, let's say, 140 characters. We can't tweet the revolution. Uh, we won't tweet freedom. Um, and in many ways, what we've done is, e even in our desire to create those more critical uh, cultures uh, around education, we're seeking to reduce it down to you know, one particular formula. And I always remember a statement uh, by uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, who stated, freedom is an endless meeting. And in many ways, Freedom uh, comes about, or our future will come about, in the meeting spaces of individuals uh, coming together in small groups uh, and figuring out, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I don't think that that is given up. Uh, in our mass-mediated uh, culture today, those uh, messages may be, may be harder to come by. But I generally believe, I don't, I don't live through the media, I live through people. And whenever, I mean, uh, great to have a friend like Ron who's able to bring me here and we're able to, uh, Ron comes over to Brown and connects with us there. Uh, it's those meetings and meeting those people that sustain me. Uh, and that sustains the vision of the future. Um, no one would have ever imagined uh, 50 years ago in 19, 1963, no one would never have imagined the world in which we inhabit. They had a vision for it. I mean, King, as early as 1964, thought that we'd have an African-American president in roughly 25 years. So people knew that things would change. How they would change would be up to those future generations. They were committed to putting into place uh, certain ideas or certain visions that we can then draw upon and extend in ways they could never have imagined. That's our responsibility today to put in place those visions, those ideas, to begin to plant those seeds. We're not gonna reap that harvest. Future generations will. And they're gonna live in a world vi vastly different than ours. I am idealistic enough to think that we will live a new experience of freedom 50 years from now that will be much more robust, much more capacious, much more inclusive than the freedom we have now. I do believe that we will live a moment, we will, live, we will have a society that will uh, tackle the inequalities of life and of our economy. That capitalism is not inevitable. Uh, this is not the best of all possible worlds. Uh, if we think about our contemporary world, we know we live on, in an unsustainable uh, financial model. Uh, and it's unsustainable not only by the logics of capital, but more importantly, it's unsustainable for our, uh, for our human existence and our ecological existence. Things will change. If we want them to change for the better, we need to get to work now. Um, and I believe they will. There are enough good people out here who are working. Um, I'm serving as the PT, uh, president of my daughter's PTO at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School in Providence, Rhode Island. And I see people every day uh, working with their children, uh, working in this public school in Providence, uh, who are working for a better future. And when I see those 618 students at MLK Elementary, I say, I see a beautiful future that has all the possibility and all the hope that we, that, uh, that we like in our contemporary moment. They're gonna make it happen. I believe in that. Students today are not the way they were in the 60s. We've heard that cliche. Yeah. Uh, trying to organize for it. Just, this is a little bit of an advertising. Uh, the governor of uh, Massachusetts has proposed a raise an income tax progressive 
that would then bring a great deal of money to <coughs> education, among other things, to the Commonwealth. That $4 million just to our own college. There's a rally uh, or advocacy day at the State House on Tuesday. Um, the president uh, has offered to pay for a bus to bring students from all the 29 colleges, but mm -hmm. from here. We can only get so far only five or six students to say they're going to go on the bus. I hope maybe some of you will consider it. Uh, it's a free bus, there'll be free lunch. The governor will be speaking and there'll be students from all, over, all 29 public colleges and universities. Um, I know the student senate has been trying to organize, but the fact that right as of now, we only have five or six students sort of indicates that people are not aware of their political power. So the only way this is going to happen if people put pressure on the legislature to allocate the money. Well, maybe we, it, and if, we, if this doesn't happen now, it's not going to come around again. So this mm -hmm. is a political um, process. And legislatures, our senators, our representatives of the state will have to know that they have to do this. They have to do the right thing. We've lost $800 million in the last 10 years to higher ed. Mm -hmm. And this is a chance to change, turn that around. But only if students make themselves uh, known. So I hope somebody will consider the bus will be leaving on Tuesday at 8.30 in front of the administration building. Uh, anybody who thinks they can make it could just be there at 8.30 or notify Wendy Pimentel, who's in Vice President Ozek's office, I don't have the extension, or 225, you can go there and tell her, do you want to go on the bus? So that's sort of an advertisement. I wanted to get to uh, something that I know you know a lot about. <laughs> and uh, I had the pleasure uh, a couple years ago, uh, a conference that you organized at Brown around the anniversary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, which was one of the foremost groups in the 60s to push for equal rights, mm -hmm. among other things. And um, that was students. And that was precipitated, and maybe you can elaborate on this, there was one gentleman who lives in New Hampshire, who lives in New, New Bedford, Bedford. Yep. Real, uh, yeah. who was a freshman in a dorm in uh, college in North Carolina, he and a couple of his friends just said, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. They went down to the Woolworths and sat in, and that precipitated a sit-in movement that eventually led to the establishment of the yeah. state. Yeah, so, no um, one, no one would have imagined that what happened that February 1st, 1960 would light that fire. Right. I mean, the one thing that we have to always remember is that no one knows when the fire is going to be lit. Who's going to be the spark? What is going to be that thing? I mean, we, we're talking about this <coughs> at, you know, in history because we're creating a narrative. We're going to create a historical narrative and we're going to pick up these events. But there were sit-ins before. Diane Nash and the folks out in Nashville uh, started the sit-in movement in the, in the 1950s. There were sit-ins in the 1940s in Washington, D.C. There were sit-ins uh, in the 1930s. Uh, there was also don't buy where you can't work campaigns. There were uprisings on uh, black college campuses in the 1920s. No one knows what spark is going to happen. It could be that the spark for this generation will be that rally uh, at the State House uh, next Tuesday. Um, and it started, I mean, the reason I stated that King was assassinated when he was 39, I want you to remember as students that the black freedom struggle and the movements of change across the world start with students, start with the young. Don't trust us old adult teachers. I mean, we're, we're not gonna do anything. <laughs> We got a, we got bills to pay, you know. We got family commitments. I mean, you don't don't trust us. I mean, just don't. Uh, uh, trust yourselves. Uh, always, always go with yourselves. I mean, when you think of SNCC, I look at uh, my uh, dear friend Charlie Cobb. He was a freshman at Howard University, and he had he thought he was going to go down and uh, work in uh, go down to Texas for a workshop. He stopped in Mississippi. Um, uh, Hollis Watkins said, why are you going to Texas for a workshop when the movement is here? The next thing you know, uh, he spends the next seven years in Mississippi, then goes on a career in journalism. You know, he never finishes school, writes a number of books, and now he's a professor at Brown. It was just serendipity. I mean, this is how we have to think about it. We don't know. It could be you. I mean, no one would have known that uh, this, this 20, 
uh, when King started uh, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, what, 26 or 28 year old? That's, that's how old he was. And he was considered, you know, very, very young. And of course, he was assassinated uh, and killed when he was 39. Most people, I mean, 13 years, 26 to 39. That's how long his public career was. That was it. And it's really a flash. And of course, toward the end of his life, no one was there. I mean, Baynard Rustin, you know, by 1965, Baynard Rustin has said, it's time to move from protest to politics. King is talking about a poor people's campaign the most disenfranchised group. Why would you want to work with poor people? You're going to set up a resurrection city in front, of Wash in, in front of the Capitol. When we look at the Occupy movement, I was speaking on this at a teaching, I said, well, I've seen Occupy movement, I, uh, it's resurrection city. It's the poor people's campaign. It was always part of the freedom struggle. The 1963 March on Washington was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. No one's just going to come and march for anything. They're going to march for jobs, yeah, and they'll march for freedom. So in many ways, the Tuesday event is about your freedom, the freedom to create a new higher ed community, a freedom to create a new uh, Bristol Community College, and a freedom to create a new future for all of us. That's, what this is, that's what's at stake. $4 million, that's the material reality. But $4 million becomes but a small down payment on the new experience of freedom that we're, that, that's being developed here at Bristol Community College and the education that you're receiving. That's what uh, should be compelling you to get on that bus. That's what's compelling you to put pressure on your elected representatives. And more importantly, that should be the vision as you walk, as you come back to Bristol Community College to continue to agitate, to continue to struggle for that freedom that's not just going to come from Beacon Hill. It's going to come out of your imaginations and the expanse of freedom that you want in this particular moment. Don't settle for just $4 million. That's not going to buy your freedom. $4 million is but a down payment. It's but a symbol, the cost of which is the dedication and commitment that you exhibit for the rest of your lives. And if Bristol Community College provides you with that, that's what you take. And then, of course, you come to Brown, and we'll continue it. <laughs> All right? Thank you. We have a little more time left. Of course, we get, there's uh, another one. <laughs> yeah. And so, but, you know, we talk about freedom and different visions. Even when we go back in history, people see the difference between, are they pure difference between, for example, Malcolm X and Dr. King? So how do you bring that about? Even though we know that it's more complicated. Oh. Uh, and same thing with students in Smith. They went through these struggles about yeah. how do you bring, you get discouraged and you don't get things immediately. Oh, yeah. I mean, don't, um, yeah, sometimes it's hard. You get me on a bad day, I'm like, yeah, no. Nah. This is not happening. Um, I need to figure out what I'm doing with my life. I need to figure out where I'm going. And you do get discouraged. I mean, that's the, that's the reality. Um, but you do get re-energized. And it's at those moments where you plug in to your, your comrades, uh, your, your, your family members, uh, your teachers, your uh, dear friends in the freedom struggle, or you're able to visit somewhere else. Just move away, you know, go out and just have a different vision. You know, come down to Brown, come visit us in Churchill House. You get energized, re uh, plug in, and then you go back and fight some more. Um, I'm energized this morning. Uh, I have to go back and uh, we're in the midst of a faculty search and of course people are struggling and fighting for who to, who to bring in to Brown and 
of course, you know, we, we have some very conscious uh, brothers and sisters applying for the position. And you know what, we do need allies in the, in the battle ahead. And so I'm getting energy from today that I'll be able to uh, uh, translate uh, in that struggle to bring in more conscious brothers and sisters uh, to Brown University, who are then able to bring you down to Brown University, who will then energize us. Um, that's what it's about. It's plugging in to those networks, plugging in to one another, and being uh, rejuvenated uh, by the presence, the spirit, uh, of each other and also the memories of those struggles in the past where no one thought, who would have thought that in Montgomery, Alabama, individuals would stop riding a bus for over a year? An entire community. Who would have thought? No one would understand that. It's unthinkable. But ex freedom is always unthinkable. It's about the deeds that we do. And y'all are doing it today. So, thank you.